Father, we glorify you, and I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you are always working, and I thank you for your plans. I thank you for your protection. I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. I thank you, Father, for all the grace that you give unto us, Lord God. We glorify you. We magnify you. You are worthy to be praised, Father. From the rising of the sun until the setting of the same, you are still worthy to be praised, and you never change. You never change, God. You never change. You're the same yesterday, and you are the same today and forevermore. You will reign forever. You are the king of kings. You are the king of glory. Everything belongs unto you. You may rent it out, and you may lease it, but it still belongs to you, and every knee shall have to bow and confess and have to give an account according to you of what we did with our time in your possessions, but it's still yours, God. It is still yours, God. It is still yours. Father, we belong to you. Our time belongs to you. Our lives belong to you. We are yours. This world, the earth is the Lord's, you said. And so we believe it, Father, Lord God. Power belongs to God, and we believe it. So we thank you, and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He is still the king. He is still the king. And although it looks like there's no control and everything is everywhere. He's still the king and he's still God. That's why he, the devil gets mad when he decides to be merciful to you when you don't deserve it because he's still God. He'll do it just to prove a point that I still love him no matter how far deep they go left. I still love him because I'm still God. That is my character. He's still God. He is still God. He's still king of kings. And he's still in control. His plans will prevail. The Bible says that many are the, the, the plans of a man, but it is the purposes of the Lord that will prevail. It's the purposes of the Lord that will prevail. That's why it's best to get on his side. Amen. I don't want to be caught as his opponent. I don't want to be caught on the enemy's ter- in the enemy's territory. I want to be caught on his side. I want to be his teammate. I don't want to be somebody he opposes. I want to be his teammate, so I'm doing all that I can to make sure I'm on his side, to make sure my life looks like him, to make sure it looks like I'm playing for the right team. God is still God, and I know the world has something to say about that, and I know the world is saying that there are many gods, but there's still only one true and living God. There's still only one true and living God. There's still only one way to God. And that's through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So that's what we believe. And that's what the enemy tries to attack. Because I know sometimes we can begin to question, is God still there? Am I just crazy? Is God real? If he is, then why am I going through what I'm going through? Why don't I see him moving how how he's moving? And why is the world in chaos? So we begin to question certain things. And I know, and that's why it's called the dark hour. Because you begin to lose sight. That's why sin is a problem. Because it pulls me into a realm of darkness to where I don't no longer can see. And now I'm, 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 I'm up for deception. And the worst thing about deception is you don't know you're there. The worst thing about deception is you think you see. But what you see is not true. That's the worst place to be. I don't want to be deceived. It's literally, when you, when you study the word deception, it's to set a trap for your own life. Can you imagine? Setting a trap for your own life. I'm just talking, and I'm not even in the Word. But I even felt today, honestly, I didn't even want to have ordinary church service. I just felt, even in worship, I wanted to just go to a different place. And I don't want to waste your time, but I'm not really in the playing mood today, honestly. (laughs) You know? And so there's a couple of things that I'm going to say, and I'm going to allow God to do what he wants to do. Um, today I just want to talk to you. I don't really want to preach a sermon like that. I don't really want to just give you the one, two, three points. I kind of just want to talk to you about some stuff I see in the Bible and some stuff I see in the church. Is that okay? Okay. If you can, turn with me to John three, sixteen. A 
I'm reading out of the New and Living Translation. John 3, 16. And I'm going to read until verse, I'll read to verse 21. When you have it, say amen. amen. I still hear some pages turning, so I'll wait. For this is how God loved the world. For this is how God loved the church. No, he loved the world. For this is how God loved the believers. No, the world. For this is how God loved the world. God loved the world. I want to stop and, and let that sit. God loved the world. Because a lot of times we think that it's just he did all of this for the church. He did this for the world. For this is how he loved the world. The, the world, the thing that doesn't look like him, the thing that talks contrary to him, the thing that cusses, the thing that fornicates and kills, the thing that destroys, the thing that doesn't bring life, the thing that opposes him, the thing that killed him. This is how he loved the world. And I, I got to get church people to start believing that God loves the world because I, sometimes we get so angry with the world and we stop believing that and we want to just judge the world. But he said this is how he loved the world. If we can get that part ingrained inside of us, I think our churches will look a little bit different. This is how he loved the world. We got an attitude sometimes to where I just can't stand the world. I can't stand how they talk, look. I can't stand how they move. I can't, and it, it's so distasteful to where now you completely separate yourself. But God loved the world to where he sent something in. He gave something. His love was not just the love that was just with words. His love was actionable. Love is actionable. For this is how God loved the world. So love should have a how to it. Amen? Love should have a how to it. That's why that when the Bible starts talking about love, it says it's patient. It's kind. It, it remembers no wrongs. It's hopeful. How? Your love should always have a how to it. It's how it's expressed. It should not just be a feeling. It shouldn't just be a feeling. Amen? For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Not to do what? But to say, not to do what? But to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is this, is based upon this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light. For their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light. And refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. But so, so, so I'm going to read that again. Verse 20. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Amen. So God loved the world, and he sent his son into the world, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Hmm. Let's start with talking about life. Jesus said, what is life? This is eternal life, that we may know him, in John 17, that we may know him. 
You have to, in order to understand life, you have to understand what, it, what death is. Death is a separation. The way life works is whatever is has to be connected to the source of, from which it came or it dies. Right? Whatever is disconnected from the source from which it came is dying. So, so if I have a plant that's in the ground and I disconnect it from which it was, it begins to die. Right? And so you have to understand that man has a physical body but is a spirit. So the physical body came from the earth, and it needs what's of the earth. This is why you can't live without eating food and water and drinking water. But the spirit did not come from the earth. It came from within God. He blew into that dirt body that's of the earth, and you became a human, a dirt body that has a spirit. Humus means dirt of the earth, and man is a spirit. So in order to not die, you have to consistently be connected. So this is why we call it the great fall of man. Because when sin came into the earth, there was a great separation which caused death to be. You were separated from God. And so in order to get you reconnected, he sent his son into the earth. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning. Nothing that was made was not made through him. But everything that was made came through and sustained by the word. In him was life. And this life was the light of man. And the word dwelt among, became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, this is important because I need you to understand what God really did. That, that word in the beginning was the word. That word right there in the Greek is logos. It's where we get the word logic. So when he said in the beginning was the word, he was saying in the beginning was God in the way he thought about everything. Was God in the way he thought. And nothing that was made was made without the way God thought about everything. And the way God thought about everything became flesh. And dwelt among us. This is why we say he is the way. This is why he is the Messiah. Because he had the words that will lead us to live a lifestyle that will align to how he thought, how he thinks, in order to be connected to him. This is why, this is why he said eternal life is to know him. He is Emmanuel, God within the flesh that dwelt among us. And he came to talk to us about stuff. He said, don't do this, do this. This is the way you ought to behave. This is how you do it. And what he was doing was he was teaching us how to think. He was teaching us how to live, how to be connected to God. So this is why he says, I am the way. I'm the way in the relationship. I am the truth that will set you free from the stuff that's been keeping you out of the way. And I am life because inside of me, you will find the life that you need because I am your connection. Through me, you will be reunited with the Father. So God sent his son because the problem was sin. Sin is rebellion. Sin is to oppose. Sin really, so sin, the the. the bad part about sin is that it goes against the will of the father and it says I will not it's to rebel against his way this is why God said when you eat this because I've given you my will you are now separating and rebelling from where I am because my where my will is that's where I am so every time you commit a sin you are choosing to go against his will you understand you are choosing to separate yourself. You understand? Okay. So the problem is they were perishing. 
They were without life. They were not connected to me. So I sent my son, and of course he had to die and pay the price for their sins, but he also had to be raised up in order to live inside of them so they can consistently be connected to me. You understand? That's why the Holy, he said, it's good that I go to the Father because I'm going to send. I know this is very educational, but we'll change in a little bit. We'll, 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 I'm going to send the Holy Spirit because he needs to live in everybody because my goal was that there will be a kingdom on this earth and it will be ruled by an invisible government that lives inside of you that's now showing you the way consistently. So you never were supposed to have kings and queens because I was the invisible king and queen. This is why he got so upset with the Israelites because they said, we want a king like everyone else. We want an external government. But I brought you out of Egypt and you, you had picked up some of those ways and you wanted to live like them. And, but I brought you out so that I might be your God and you might be my people and I might rule within you. And everyone would be the way they are supposed to be because I'm in everybody. Consistent rulership. So as people were perishing, they didn't have life. They didn't have life. We were dying. We were dying because we had no connection. So he sent his son. And whoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. would be reconnected. The issue comes with the belief. Because belief is not so much just, I know you can do it. Belief is connected to action. This is why Jesus said, whoever believeth on me, let him come unto me. And out of his belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. You can't really say, I completely believe without coming. That's like you having an ailment and you're dying. And somebody came and told you about a way that you can live. And you say, well, that's good. But you never seek out the way to live. So it's not complete. That's why they would say faith without works is what? You're still in a dead situation because you never did the work that matches what you quote unquote believe. So there's a lot of people that, that's in the church that don't really believe. Because I'm remaining with my sickness and I have not chose to bring it to you because I don't really believe what you can do. I don't really believe that you can cure my ailment. I don't really believe you can deal with my cravings and you can deal with my desires and what I really want and what I really, my issues. I don't really believe, so I keep it. I keep it and I stay the same. I stay the same. I stay the same. I stay the same day in and day out. And I come to church, but I stay the same. And I meet and I pray and I preach, but I stay the same. And I sing songs and I do all this, but I stay the same because there's something within me that's not really convinced that I can bring this to you and experience some type of change. So I stay the same. And what happens is you start to become lukewarm. You start to become lukewarm, and eventually the temptations and the devices of the enemy become more luring and enticing versus what God says I have to offer. So let the enemy satisfy my pain. Let the enemy satisfy my sadness. Let the enemy satisfy my hurt. Let the enemy have his, because I'm not getting it from God, because I'm not willing to come to him in the way he desires. Because he said, you'll find me when you seek what? With your whole, and that's the problem. The cost is too high sometimes, I guess. The cost is too high. You'll find me when you seek me with your, I don't want a piece. I want your whole heart. I want all of it. I want you to be like the man who found some, a pearl and, and he went and sold everything just so I can get the pearl. I want all of you. I don't just want a piece of you. I need you to become fully convinced to where, to where you won't care. You will press through it until I find you. I'll be like the woman with the issue of blood. I have an issue and I'm going to press and I don't care what obstacles is there because this is my only solution. So the problem is belief. Because he didn't send his son to judge the world, but to save the world. But to save the world. And the judgment is on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved 
the darkness more than the light. What's the title of my message? The title of my sermon is called Hidden in the Dark. People loved the darkness more than they loved the light. Because sometimes I can't handle seeing what's really there. And, and the thing about God is his light. Remember, he says, in him was life, and his life was the light of man. When his life is displayed in front of me, now everything that was around me becomes illuminated, and I get to really see the mess that I'm in. I get to see the impact that it's having. I get to, but when it was dark outside, I didn't see none of this, and I was okay. It's like somebody come into your room, and they flip the light switch on, and now you can see the mess. But when it was off, everything looked clean. But now I'm stuck looking at all this stuff that's still there. So I don't want to see it no more. I don't want to deal with it no more. I would rather just keep the lights off because I was, at least I was able to feel good about myself. But now you're sitting here telling me something, showing me something, exposing something. Now I have to make decisions. Now I have to make choices. Now I'm stuck with, am I going to clean up this mess or am I not going to clean up? With, there's no excuse. That's why God said there's no excuse. People love darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. Fear their sins will be exposed. For fear their sins will be exposed. For fear their sins will be exposed. That word exposed is interesting. Can I tell you guys a story? So, um... When I first got saved, right, I, um, my only goal in salvation was I just want to try him completely. I, I had tried everything else. I understood that everything else was empty. I seen people trying the same stuff that I was trying, and it looked empty. It did not look like they were being satisfied in their soul. They were still dead. Everybody was zombies, right? Walking around, and I was tired of being a zombie. So my only goal was I am going to try him with everything that I have. I'm going to press, and I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. I'm going to do everything he's calling me to do, and I'm going to try. And if I fail, I'm already failing, so I ain't got nothing to lose. I didn't have nothing to lose. I had nothing to prove to nobody. I didn't care what anybody thought. I was just going to try him completely. And it wasn't until a couple months in, somebody told me, oh, you saved. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, am I saved? <laughs> I'm serious because I didn't care about the title of being saved. I just knew I wanted to try him completely. So some, they, they, you say, and they had been watching me and looking at the fruits of my life. And I was like, okay, I'm saved. The validation felt good. It began to mean something to more and more people. Valid, oh, you saved, yeah, you saved, brother. Oh, come on in, come on in. I made it into the club. I made it into the club. And um, soon that validation began to mean something. Being in the club began to mean something. I'm talking about the church. Began to mean something. And then I began to, to grow in influence and Grown and utilizing talents and skills. And I begin to, to maneuver and grow within the, 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 the church. And I begin to, to grow and people begin to look at me. And I got responsibility. And I was carried into these certain places and doors would open up. And, and before I knew it, I began to be more concerned about the image and the validation. And I lost what I once had. Because when I had what I first had, I didn't care. I, I, there was a complete honesty. I was completely open. I didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't care about your judgments because I already, I know I'm a heathen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't care about, like, you know, one Monday, I, uh, fornicate on Monday, uh, cuss on Tuesday. But I, I was trying to try him completely. So I was experiencing this growth. But I didn't care. I had this complete honesty. I wanted the light. I wanted him to expose everything that was not the way it was supposed to be. I wanted to know your way completely. And I didn't care if other people see me fall. 
I was going to whoever I could. If they looked like they knew the word, or if they looked like they were maneuvering some type of way, that an authority within the kingdom, I was going to them because, hey, I really want to get this right with all of my heart. But, 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 when you have things that you are afraid to lose, respect that you are afraid to lose. I said respect that you are afraid to lose. Influence that you are afraid to lose. Because we feel like, oh man, it takes so long to get to a place of influence. It takes so long to get to a place of building. I'm, I'm talking to leaders wherever you are. When you've built up to that type of point, your name, your reputation, whatever it is, you begin to conceal things. So although this is a kingdom of light and Christ has given me light to expose my heart. And, and, you know, the heart is deceitful and wicked, but God's light shines and he begins to divide my motives and intentions. And, and I know I'm living and I know what's right and what's wrong, but, 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 but now you're concealing. To conceal is, if you can imagine, you turn on the lights and you stand in front of something that shouldn't be there. You begin to keep it out of sight. What happens if the light is on and something is there and you step in front of it? What does it cast behind you? It casts a shadow. Who rules in darkness? So the enemy is allowed to step on in there and begin to have a foothold and to do whatever he wants to do. Because God said, there's so many secrets in the church. There's so many things being concealed. So much that we don't want to talk about. So much that people will never know unless I'm dead. <laughs> so much that we hide from one another, our friends, spouses, pastors, cousins, brothers, sisters, children. And it's casting shadows. I said it's casting shadows. It's casting shadows. 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 Every time I think about shadows and light, I think about the Lion King. When, when, when Mufasa told his son, everything that the light touches, this is where we rule. But everything that, that's dark over there, that's another kingdom. And it's casting shadow. And we brought these shadows into the church. If we get enough shadows, I bet you it'll look like nighttime. So now we're in this predicament where there's a lot of shadows. And so as I lived this way, and I would hide stuff. I would hide perversion. I would hide lust and I would hide pornography and I would hide issues. Because I was, I, was, I was ashamed. So I concealed them. Keep it out of sight. Keep it out of sight. Keep it out of sight. Deal with it. Just you and God. You and God. Keep it out of sight. Deal with it. You and God. Keep it out of sight. Deal with it. You and God. And this is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. And so what God does is, eventually you'll move into pride. And pride is about self-sufficiency. Pride is about leaning on your own understanding. Pride is about human effort and human ability. Pride is about, I can do it. Pride is, I'm going to keep it together. And so, and, so, and so we moved into pride. I moved into pride. And what happens is you will hit a plateau within the kingdom of God. You won't be able to keep going up. And if you're not careful, if you're not careful, I said if you're not careful, God will begin to humiliate you. I know you think you can conceal it and be okay with it, but God will humiliate you. What does he do to the proud? He does what? Opposes the proud. A haughty eye comes before what? A fall. God will begin to humiliate you. 
So what happened? Marriage start being attacked. Humiliation. Friendships and not able to receive from everybody. And humiliation. Not experiencing the presence of God and, and, and on, on, on the jobs and, and, and seeing him work consistently through. That's humiliation. And before you know it, if you're not careful, this humiliation will become public. So either you humble yourself or I will humiliate you. I'll give you a Nebuchadnezzar experience. I'll turn you into an animal in front of everybody and let them see your true colors. What you've been hiding in the inside, I'll bring it to the outside so everybody can see what's really in there. Humiliation. One way or another is coming to the light. Either you want to bring it or I'm going to bring it. Humiliation. I know this is a hard word. It's a difficult word. Because why do we conceal things? Why do we keep things out of sight? Because is it because of the shame that I'll have to go through if I expose it? Is it because of the fear of what people might think about me if I really expose this thing? What am I supposed to be? And, uh, and what, what, will people leave me now? Will they not listen to me any longer? Will I lose my calling? Will I lose the position that I'm supposed to be in? How? I got all of these things. And that's all pride talking. That's all pride talking. Because if God is the one who gives increase, who can take it away? With door, the doors that God opened, who can close? This deception. You are setting a trap for your own life. It's too painful because true humility is not something that you just try to do. Humility is a state of your heart that happens after you have lowered yourself. It's a state of your heart after you have emptied. The Bible says Christ emptied himself and became the form of a servant, even unto death. He sought no glory for himself. I don't care about my name. The only reason you know my name is because God wants you to know my name. It's because he wanted me to be glorified because the way I live, I have no reputation for myself. That's what true humility is, to where you surrender your name completely. Run it through the, through the mud. Reject me. It's often those who are rejected by the world that God accepts anyway. It's not, it's not until it becomes it's not you. It's the voice of God working through you. Because his sheep are going to hear that voice regardless of where you are. So we become so convinced. We convince ourselves that I'm going to lose so much. And it's a trap. You're taking away your own life. So we conceal. One of the things that happens when you conceal and you keep things out of sight is you now have disconnected yourself from the body. Those who conceal their sins shall not prosper. But those who confess and forsake shall receive mercy. Mercy. You know, there's a reason why you don't want to worship like that. Or when people praise God, it's more of a, a, a chore. Because you haven't experienced the real mercy of God. To where when you, you experience, I'm really nothing before you, and the only way I'm here is because you've been merciful and kind to me. Then when we say hallelujah, now your hallelujah becomes something completely different. It means something to you, and you begin to say Hosanna. Because we are forsaking mercy. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain what? Mercy and find what? Help in your time of need. You can't get no help because you're not going to the throne where there's mercy because you choose to conceal. It's painful. When you expose these things, it's painful to confess some stuff. I'm not going to tell you it ain't. 
I'm not going to lie to you. It is painful. Because you're dying. You're letting go of something you've held on to for so long. You're letting go of that name that you fought so hard to make and to get. And for all of the things you fought for in life, you're, you're dying. You're letting go of it. And it hurts to let go of it because that's all you've known for so long. When you're in that place, it's lonely. And you feel like you all you got. Because people can't be intimate with you because of the concealing. Your relationships will always only go so far. Because there's things I have to keep out of sight. I have now, I have now put up walls and created rooms that nobody knows about. But I live in that room. This is what happened with, with, with Saul. He couldn't repent because of what he didn't want to let go. But the people, but the people. And God humiliated Saul. Don't allow the devil to deceive you in thinking that holding on to your secrets is what's best. Because it's hurting you and it's hurting those around you. I said it's hurting you and it's hurting those around you. You can't get the grace that you need. And the body cannot connect to you the way it needs to connect to you. And he can't do nothing but humiliate you because of what you continue to be in. So if he commands, confess. What do we do? Lorenzo, could you, could you um, play keys for me? So what are we going to do is I'm going to call some people up for altar call to pray. It says, confess your sins and pray for one another that you may be healed. I want you to search in your hearts. The things that you don't want to tell people, the things that you've been choosing to keep a secret, I know it's in you. The battles that we deal with are private place. And we just, oh, it's just me. I know it's in here. The things that we are keeping out of sight because of the shame and the judgment. I know it's in here. Let's stand. I'm going to ask, um, hey, Tisha, can you come up to the front? We got a couple of people coming up to the front. Can we just come across this row right here?